Uh, turn your volume up. Can you, can you hear me okay? Can you turn the volume up a bit? Okay, how's that? Can no, you hear me more still, We need to hear him better. There's a way to connect. That's the best I can do. I have a studio mic here, so it should be picking things up okay. Shall I keep speaking so you can test? Yes, please. It's better. Okay, is that better now? It's getting can better. <laughs> can you hear him? Okay, good. Bona tarda, good afternoon. Uh, it's a great joy, a uh, great honor to be here for this uh, round table in the company of Professor Robert Hatton and Professor Clive McClelland joining us from uh, the United Kingdom. And um, we are ready to, uh, to start, but before we start, uh, I should like very briefly to say uh, a word of thanks and congratulations to the organizers, all the people involved in the organization of this wonderful event, and in particular to Professor Hero Tarasti and uh, Professor Joan Grimald, uh, who have managed this little miracle of uh, <laughs> making this conference possible. As you know, uh, the conference was originally planned for the year 2020, and for obvious reasons, it couldn't take place by then, so it had to be postponed twice. And here we are. Thank you, Joan and Ero, for keeping uh, this conference alive. <laughs> and the question of the, uh, the dates uh, actually has a direct bearing um, on our subject this afternoon, because we were supposed to be um, celebrating the 40th anniversary of uh, Leonard Ratner's uh, famous book, Classic Music, which, having been published originally in 1980, would be 40 years old in 2020. Now uh, we have two extra years have passed, and uh, um, I think uh, it is uh, as good as a uh, reason as any to uh, commemorate uh, an important book. So we are going to commemorate the 42nd anniversary of classic <laughs> music. Um, now, I think we could start by saying that uh, there is no doubt that the notion of uh, the musical topic, because it is usually the musical topic we remember when we remember the book, classic music, this could be uh, a bit unfair uh, to the rest of the book, but things are what they are. Uh, so uh, the notion of the musical topic entered the vocabulary of musicology, as we all know, in the English-speaking world at least, around 1980 with the publication of Leonard Ratner's now canonic classic music. And yet I would like to say that uh, I've always felt there is something a bit paradoxical about Ratner's role as the originator of topic theory as we understand it today. His exposition of the subject in his magnum opus amounts to no more than 30 pages, as if to suggest that sometimes the impact of an idea is completely out of proportion to the amount of text devoted to its presentation. Surely, Radner returns to the subject elsewhere in the book and in later writings as well, but still. So perhaps we could start by asking ourselves, what is it that makes an idea particularly successful in the competing arena of musicological scholarship? And what exactly was it that made Ratner's intuition about topics so fruitful? Um, Clive, perhaps you could uh, say a little about the state of scholarship um, on the classical period around 1980, so that we could have a little bit more context for uh, uh, the book. 
Uh, yeah, I guess so. Uh, I mean, uh, as one of the uh, older members on this panel, um, uh, I mean, I, I was actually an undergraduate student uh, at the time that this book came out. I was uh, studying uh, at Birmingham. Um, I think as far as 18th century music was concerned, the, the really seminal book at that time was, was Charles Rosen's uh, the, the Classical Style. Uh, uh, you know, this was the book that, that, that I think all undergraduates of my generation who were interested in 18th century music uh, and early 19th century music uh, uh, were reading at, at that time. Uh, it was very influential and, and, and very helpful. Um, and I think um, one of the hallmarks of that book was, was the amount of detail, the amount of music examples, the, the way that he was able to illustrate uh, with reference to uh, very precise uh, extracts uh, from the classical repertoire. Uh, and, and I guess that's something that, that Ratner picked up on because one of the uh, important things about classic music is that it's a lot of music examples that, that we can uh, look at and, and, and hopefully hear in our heads or play on the piano or find a recording. Um, and uh, it's, it's approaching this music through the ears, uh, I guess, which is one of the important things and certainly one of the things that appeal to me uh, as a young music analyst. Um, so um, I guess I uh, had brought up very much the tradition of uh, structural analysis or, or form and and, uh, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, uh, and obviously um, you know, that was still very much being taught in universities at that time. Uh, uh, there wasn't really teaching of uh, sort of semiotics or rhetoric or any, anything like that. Even even the idea of the doctrine of affections was established, I suppose, but but um, you know, it wasn't it wasn't really taught. Um, uh, Bookoff's article in the New Grove Dictionary that came out in in 1980 uh, at around the same time uh, as as Ratner's uh, book. Uh, was certainly helpful in that respect. It, it, it enumerated a lot of things that, that I didn't know about Baroque music at that time and approaching it from a rhetorical perspective uh, uh, became clearer to me uh, as, as a result of, of, of that article. Um, and of course, for me, because I was interested um, in, in uh, music that had discontinuous elements in it, um, I was brought up to believe the orthodoxy of Sturm und Drang. Uh, and uh, uh, until such times I used this phrase in an essay, uh, which was then uh, corrected by my tutor at the time, uh, uh, Nigel Fortune, uh, one of the three editors of the aforementioned uh, Grove 1980. Um, and uh, he did this simply by inserting the word so-called in front of uh, the phrase Sturm und Drang, as I had used in, in my essay, and this piqued my interest very much. This was, I guess, my first lesson in uh, the value of questioning orthodoxy. Um, I have to say I wasn't really aware of Ratner in my undergraduate years. It was only when I came back to university uh, about 10 or 12 years later uh, to do a master's degree at Lincoln, where I was studying analysis with Julian Rushton. Uh, and he introduced me to the idea of topic theory and obviously uh, to, to, to Ratner's book. Uh, and, and it was an absolute revelation to me. I, it was really uh, important. Um, I had, uh, up until that time, uh, been a teacher of traditional formal analysis. Um, I was very much a convert to the historically informed approach to performing 18th century music. So LP box set of Mozart late symphonies by Carrie Ann uh, was donated to the charity shop and uh, replaced by Hogwarts Academy of Music. Um, and I guess uh, Ratner seemed to chime in with this very well. We've already heard earlier today about, about the relationship between historically informed performance and, and rhetoric in music. And, and even at this time, that, that seemed to be a very obvious link uh, that, that these two things were, were, were very complementary. It spoke to the audience in a different way from listening to it in a purely structural way, uh, if you like. So I developed a genuine appreciation for the underlying rhetorical discourse um, and, and my listening was, was 
enhance the, the tempos, the text, colors, uh, the composer's message all seemed uh, so much clearer to me. So um, when later on I got to the stage where I was applying for a, a full-time post uh, at Leeds University, um, I delivered a, a sample lecture on uh, on Ratner's topic theory uh, with lots of audio extracts uh, on cassette tape back then in those days. Um, and uh, it went down well enough. So uh, I guess I owe Ratner my current job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, this is also a nice, a nice lead up to the question of how Ratner's ideas were picked up and uh, eventually developed, sometimes transformed by um, many other important scholars like Y. Jameson Allenbrook, Kofi Agao, Robert Hatton. Raymond Monell, Clive McClelland, and others, but we'll get to that later. Um, now I'd like to dwell a bit on the particulars of Ratner's conception of the musical topic. Although the term topic is an anglicized form of the Greek topos, as everybody knows, and thus a borrowing from classical rhetorical terminology, Ratner seems to have originated a more specialized usage of the word. But in fact, his own definition of the musical topic is anything but clear. This is the famous passage from classic music where the term is introduced. Music in the early 18th century developed a thesaurus of characteristic figures which formed a rich legacy for classic composers. Some of these figures were associated with various feelings and affections. Others had a picturesque flavor. They are designated here as topics, subjects for musical discourse. Topics appear as fully worked out pieces, that is, types, or as figures and progressions within a piece, that is, styles, end of quote. We thus infer that a fully worked out minuet, for instance, represents a musical type, whereas a section of a piece written in the style of a minuet, in the first movement of a sonata or a symphony, for instance, represents a style. The upshot of Ratner's definition was therefore that the distinction between types and styles could only be made contextually. In itself, an important point, even though his notion of type, perhaps akin to the concept of genre, insofar as a genre could be understood as a collection or perhaps an abstraction of types, does not accord particularly well with his description of topics as characteristic figures. In any case, Ratner's choice of examples seems a bit odd, as his list of types consists exclusively of dances and marches. He did not seem to consider that a fugue, too, can be a fully worked out piece and therefore a type. As a consequence, he mentioned the fugue only in the section on strict and learned styles, alongside military and hunt music, singing style, brilliant style, French overture, etc., etc. Inevitably, Ratner's list of styles looks like a very mixed bag, and he has been criticized for bringing a disparate range of categories, some of them debatable in themselves, as I'm sure you, Clive, would agree, under the same umbrella. Um, later scholars have, of course, added to the original list, and new topics keep cropping up every day. Ratner, however, was not the inventor of the concept of musical topic, and the fact that, with few exceptions, the older tradition of rhetorical scholarship, especially in Germany, tends to be ignored uh, today, uh, remains a bit puzzling, at least to me. Or rather, we could say that this older tradition has been more or less forgotten now. Uh, incidentally, uh, Ratner's interest in topics may have been influenced by his studies with Manfred Bukowitzer, for instance, um, and I'm wonder if Robert will pick up this thread at some point, or perhaps not, we'll see. Uh, in my view, the rhetorical roots of the theory may actually shed some light on the applicability and also the inherent ambiguity of the notion of the musical topic. My aim here is not to delve deeply into this chapter of intellectual history, but I should like to draw attention to the historical role played by Ernst Robert Kutzius' work, European Literature and the Latin Middle Ages first published in 1948, in the dissemination of the concept of topos in a sense that already differs somehow from the one inherited from the classical rhetorical tradition. The one apparently invoked by Ratner in his description of topics as subjects for musical discourse. As Colin Burrow writes in the introduction to the English language edition of Kurzius' work, I quote, 
Coursey's word topos encompasses a much wider array of phenomena than the commonplaces of the rhetorical tradition, and the boundaries of the concept are sometimes, as a result, unclear. Sometimes the topoi are presented as rhetorical building blocks of composition, but, but from time to time they are presented as atemporal truths, or even connected to Carl Jung's archetypes." End of, end of quote. By reviving the concept of topos, Curtius also gave the word a polysemic openness that has worked against any precise definition. In fact, from today's vantage point, it would be tempting to subsume Curtius' disquisition of topoi under the broader categories of intertextuality, or in Gérard Genet's more nuanced terminology, transtextuality. At the same time, Curtius himself stressed the close connections between rhetoric and music, showing an awareness of the pioneering work of Arnold Schering, for instance. Let us note the following passage, I quote. The system of teaching music was adapted from that of teaching rhetoric. There was a musical art of invention, ars inveniendi, a musical topics, and in the original German, ein musikalische topic, and so on. How often, this is actually a quote uh, from Willibald Gurlitz, Schering's uh, disciple. Uh, how often do we not see in a melody or rhythm, in a motive or a figure, in a melodic or harmonic movement, a discovery or indeed an inspiration in the modern poetic sense, whereas basically it represents nothing but one of the developments from the traditional story of Topoi, that is, a resumption, a mutation, a reworking of specific typical themes, formulas, and phrases. Here we have a description of precisely the same state of affairs that we find in the realm of literature. End of quote. And this, I think, puts an interesting spin on uh, the matter of uh, the rhetorical tradition and musical topics, because for Curtius, he was actually taking music as an example of topics uh, in order to uh, justify, in some sense, his uh, theory of topics in literature. We tend to look at these things the other way around. First comes literature, then music uh, reproduces, imitates what literature al already does. And uh, in this case, it seems to be a little bit uh, the other way around. It would seem that by reintroducing topics into the discourse of musicology, Radner was more concerned with their uses as styles than as types, thus implicitly placing himself in the tradition of Curtius and Schering, who spoke of typical themes, formulas, and phrases. Allowing for some individual variation, this was the sense espoused by later topic theory scholars, with an even more explicit emphasis on the semantic implications of the concept. Robert Hatton, for instance, wrote about topics as, quote, patches of music that trigger clear associations with styles, genres, and expressive meanings." End of quote. Accordingly, topicality would be predicated on the presence of characteristic figures within a wider context, rather than by the mere reworking of type. In this sense, closer to the notion of paradigm, model, or typology. Thus, in itself, a minuet per se would hardly count as a topic, whereas a minuet-like passage within a sonata first movement, for instance, would. A further issue was raised by Ratner in that he rounded off his presentation of topics in classic music with a brief discussion of pictorialism and word painting, a category thus placed on a level with types and styles. Raymond Monel seems to have built on Ratner's classification in his own discussion of what he termed iconic topics, as distinct from musical icons. Monel illustrates the notion of the iconic topic with the pianto, an imitation of the moan in someone in tears, the motive of a falling minor second having been conventionalized as a part of the musical representation of the lament. However, Monel's view has been challenged by Danuta Mirka in her introduction to the Oxford Handbook of Topic Theory in the following terms, I quote, Monel's iconic topics are not topics because they do not form cross-references between musical styles or genres, end of quote. But the validity of her objection seems predicated on a definition of the musical topic that is simply narrower than both Ratner and Monel's. In her view, the category of topic should be limited to the musical imitation of other music, a qualification she, is, she ascribes, not quite accurately, to Ratner himself. She also chides Monel for conflating, quote, two historically distinct types of musical imitation of extra-musical sounds, 
end of quote, subsumed under pictorialism, namely the imitation of passionate utterances and that of natural sounds. But this distinction, perhaps justified in terms of 18th century aesthetic discourse, promptly dissolves if one is to accept that the sigh, the example given of the first category, is no less a natural sound than the horse's gallop, Mirke's counterexample. And since Mirka herself acknowledges the fact that topic theory proper bears an oblique relation to 18th century aesthetic doctrine, it is hard to see why Monel's conflation of two kinds of musical imitation should be dismissed on purely historicist grounds. Is there then a good reason to exclude pictorialism from the realm of topics? The whole debate seems to hinge upon the slippery notion of mimesis as imitation, or even upon the confusing but apparently indestructible notion of the extra musical, which necessarily entails the strict separation between an inside and an outside of music. There is, of course, a trivial sense in which birdsong, per se, could be considered extra musical, but what about the imitation of birdsong? <laughs> Okay, what about the imitation bird song understood as an integral part of the rhetorical tradition of the pastoral, with composers imitating one another, imitating bird song? To give another example, what purpose would be served by a distinction between the imitation of battle sounds and the presence of military topics in a battle piece? And where in Mirka's classification of musical signs are we supposed to place movement, gesture, and other forms of embodied meaning in music beyond the sphere of dance types? In this respect, I tend to side with Hans Heinrich Egebrecht, who wrote in a different context, I quote, if something remains outside music and is not related to it, it is musically indifferent. But if, whatever this something might be, it attains to the condition of music, and insofar as it appears in music and qua music, it is musical, end of quote. To insist on the strict separation of topics and pictorialism, or ultimately of the intra and the extra musical, opens the path to endless conundrums. In conclusion, as noted by Monel, pure iconism is actually rare in music. Composers do not usually indulge in mimesis outside the framework of a wider topical field. Monel also noted that most musical icons are not pure in Umberto Eco's sense of ratio difficilis, but ruled by convention and thus symbolic like any other topics, or, as I prefer to say, even if their origin can be sought in the mimetic impulse, musical icons tend to be semantically sedimented as a shareable stock of gestures and figures. In fact, in this regard, I would even question some of Monel's distinction between musical icons in my own paper tomorrow. So I'm just building up suspense for those of you who would care to listen to my paper tomorrow. At any rate, the topical dimension of musical iconicity itself is something that Ratner seems to have uh, contemplated. And in this too, he seems to have opened the path to a better understanding of music semiotics, or to put it uh, differently, um, opening a big can of worms. And uh, uh, this is a lead up to um, further comments on the Ratner tradition. I would perhaps invite Clive to carry on from the uh, point where he left before and talk us a little bit about, um, well, his own uh, work uh, in um, deconstructing Ratner, if I can use the expression, which is also an homage we only deconstruct things that are important, of course. So we are not uh, saying bad things about Ratner, on the contrary. Great, thanks, Paolo. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, Paolo asked me really to to talk about uh, sort of you know how how this unwound from my own personal perspective. Uh, I think most people will know here uh, of my particular interest in in, in two topics: in Ombra and. Uh, in, in one that I've called Tempesta. Um, uh, and I guess my, my stimulus for writing about these was 
because I felt that that Rendra got it wrong uh, and that it needed to be corrected. Uh, so um, obviously, Ratna had had latched on to the mysterious qualities associated with uh, Ombre music, um, and that may be why he chose to regard it as some kind of a a subset of uh, of, fa- of what he called fantasia. Um, but I had a problem with that. Actually, I had two problems with that. First of all, um, Ombra is not a, a, a quasi-improvisatory topic uh, in the way that we would expect in, in Fantasia. Uh, and secondly, I would say that Fantasia itself is not really a topic, but a genre. Uh, because actually, when you look at, uh, at Fantasia music, it consists of uh, any number of different topical references. So uh, uh, whilst, yes, it has that quasi-improvisatory quality, um, the topics that you get in a fantasia are are, are very wide, actually. I mean, just just have a look at the Mozart D minor fantasia, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so I felt very strongly that ombre needed to be established as a as a topic uh, in, in its own right. And then, um, as for Sturm und Drang, the example that he gave uh, was the finale to Gluck's Don Juan of 1681. Uh, a great example of, of, of that topic, I guess. But it always struck me as odd uh, that a phrase that wasn't actually coined until uh, 15 years later uh, and in a literary context, geographically removed from Vienna, uh, was applicable here. Klinger's uh, Sturm und Drang was published in, in, in 1776, and, and it seemed odd that we were somehow back forming a label uh, for German literature and drama in the in mid 1770s uh, back forming it to to music that Gluck was writing at the beginning of the 1760s uh, that, that struck me as anachronistic so um, it seemed clear to me both opera and Tempesta de- demonstrably had their musical origins in supernatural scenes in baroque opera um, and of course, this is important too because there's no supernatural content in the German literary Sturm und Drang. So again, there is no there is no real link uh, here at all. So when uh, Danuta Mirka first uh, approached me to ask me to contribute a chapter uh, on Ombra and Sturm und Drang for uh, the Oxford Handbook of Topic Theory, um, I was first of all delighted to be asked, uh, but I was even more delighted when she uh, agreed with me that actually it was time we found a better term, uh, a better term for Sturm und Drang, uh, and and that this term would be Tempesta. Uh, it seemed to me sensible to have an Italian term as a counterpart to Ombra, since the two topics share uh, a number of their characteristics, uh, even though the emotional uh, impact, the emotional effects of these two topics is is designed to be different. Um, now, of course. Many people have been criticising uh, the use of the term Sturm und Drang for some time. I, I can't claim to be uh, the originator of that at all. In fact, uh, one of the most vocal critics uh, of uh, using this term uh, was Raymond Monell himself. Uh, he was very vocal in his dislike of the term. So um, when I had the opportunity at ICMS uh, at Edinburgh in 2012 uh, to, to give a paper on this, uh, it, it seemed the right time to do it. That that conference, you remember, was was given memory of Raymond Manel. Obviously, he was uh, based at uh, Edinburgh. I never had the uh, opportunity to meet him. Very sadly, I would love to have done so. Um, but it was seemed the right uh, platform to suggest that, that that it's time we binge drum and drang and come up with a better term. Um, and for me, uh, this occasion was actually all the more memorable uh, as I was giving my paper. Uh, Kofi Agawu was sitting right there in the front row with a b- big broad grin on his face all the way through my paper, which was a little unnerving, but on the other hand, he seemed happy with it. So I guess that was that was encouraging. Um, and certainly when I spoke to him afterwards, he was uh, um, very encouraging, actually. Uh, you know, I have to say that the book that influenced me most, particularly the master student, was his Playing With Signs. Uh, and I brought a copy along with me to the uh, to the conference in the hope that he would sign it for me, which he very kindly did. Uh, so it's very much there uh, in the top of my kind of treasured possessions. Uh, so uh, yeah, that was that was uh, really encouraging and 
Uh, and I think, uh, you know, since that book came out, uh, a lot of people seem to have been happy to adopt this term, Tempesta, uh, and it's, it's uh, rewarding for me to see that. Um, I guess um, somebody else we should mention, of course, is, is uh, Wendy Allenbrook. Uh, both she and Kofi were, were pupils of, uh, of Ratner, so I guess they're the kind of second generation, if you like, of, uh, uh, of topic theorists. Um, obviously, her study of uh, Omber in Mozart's Don Giovanni was, was, was uh, extremely uh, influential. Uh, on me, in fact, you know, I didn't really feel like a better. I've never really published anything on specifically on Mozart's Don Giovanni because she kind of did it all, really. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I suppose this means that people like me, and I guess the other people on this panel uh, today, uh, and Joanne, who uh, invited me to the conference in the first place, uh, I guess we have to think of ourselves as the third generation of uh, topic theorists. So. Uh, in this respect, uh, although there are some things that we disagree with, uh, Ratner can truly be said to be the grandfather of topic theory. So there we go. <laughs> Thank you, certainly. Um, okay, now it's the time for Robert to tell his version of the story <laughs> and his own role in it. <laughs> I want to address the issue of categorization, which you've touched upon so brilliantly already. Um, the history of topics is a theoretical construction. Many of the labels we use today, as you mentioned, were not in common use in the 18th century. But our theoretical construction may be a partial reconstruction of a tacit competency. One that not only went unspoken, but that was messy and incomplete even in its time. Evidence of common types may be found in notated scores if not in treatises or the writings of composers or contemporaneous listeners. But we should not expect to reconstruct a precisely defined taxonomy of topics, since the historical evolution of commonplaces is not likely to be neat. Rather, stylistic types become familiar through use, and they are as likely to be carved out as marked entities against an unmarked background as they are to arise from systematically paired oppositions. This irregular growth process will not result in a logical system, but rather an evolving network of relationships among common types, subject to infinite variations in their tokens, and even cross-pollination through various combinations. We might begin to theorize prototypes for such style types, based on center-periphery positioning of identifying features, as David Heinsen illustrated in his paper on Spanish indigenous dance. But what turns a style type into a topic, as Danuta Mirka has already stressed, is its importation into a new context. And importation may range from complete insertion to what might be the most minimal of illusions. This raises the stakes not only for identification, but for interpretation. Because we cannot be sure to what degree previous expressive associations of the style type will also be imported into that new context, and to what degree those associations may change through interaction with that new context. The new context may be generic, or it may already be characterized by style types or other topics that may or may not combine in predictable ways with a particularly particular imported topic. These combinations of types may exhibit degrees of compatibility and may either merge to create a new expressive meaning along the lines of the trope of metaphor or resist such merger along the lines of the trope of irony. Thus, the importation of a style type not only defines it as a topic, but also as a trope. In my 2014 article for the Oxford Handbook, edited by Danuta Mirka, I noted four axes along which we might interpret the interaction of an imported style type as a topic with its new environment. 
a high degree of compatibility means that the tropological merger may go unnoticed, as in the case of the opening of the famous Mozart piano sonata in F major, K332, where I would argue a land melody in 3-4 meter combines easily with melody and accompaniment texture, pedal point, reference to the subdominant, and even a proto-yodel as very compatible, if distinctive, parts of a larger, what I call pastoral mode. Note the hierarchy here that is implied between the umbrella pastoral mode and various more or less distinctive features or even subsets of that mode. Another hierarchical distinction may be made along the axis of the dominance. Topics may be employed with varying degrees of parametric involvement, as noted in my example of dance melody versus Alberti accompaniment, with one figure, yodel, in the melody and another, pedal point, in the bass. Such sharing of parametric space will result in one or more topics being represented by perhaps only one distinctive feature, hence a part-for-whole relationship. Synendochic. The dominant topic may also control the expressive field, with subordinate topics providing a kind of nuancing. So dominant topics create topical fields, or what I call modes, and these may also determine the expressive genre of a work. Along my third and fourth axes, they are creatively and productively employed to direct an entire discourse and or dramatic trajectory. But we will have here a simple, we will never have a simple lexicon of topical meaning since they are too flexibly deployed in too many originally complex contexts and thus require hermeneutic interpretations for each musical work. I met Leonard Ratner in the mid 90s when I was at Stanford to give a paper. He told me that he had added the chapter on topics to the opening of his celebrated classic music almost as an afterthought. Clearly, as demonstrated by his students, Wendy Allenbrook and Kofi Agawa, as mentioned, and later Roman, Raymond Monell and myself, uh, there was much further work to be done to theorize this slippery concept. And I want to mention that before the book came out in 1980, which I immediately snapped up and in 83 and began teaching um, Don Giovanni with uh, uh, Wendy Allenbrook's book, um, I had already been exposed to another strain of thought leading to topic theory, which were the seams and isotopies that both Ero Tarasti in Myth and Music and Marta Grabash in her work on Liszt had already laid out. And of course, their um, Gremasian uh, roots as well as in Hungary, the Ifelusi, I'm not pronouncing it correctly, but as well as Agerbrecht, Karbozitsky, Jironik, and others who had been working individually in these areas. And I might also mention here uh, Professor Tomaszewski in the Krakow School, who was very interested in issues of expression. Um, so the time was ripe, as we've already seen with other historical roots, and I've just added a little bit to that stream for topic theory to emerge, even though the terminology might seem overly uh, ahistorical at first, we find clear evidence in style types that we can argue for intersubjectively in the music itself. So <clears throat> I'd like to share with you something, and if I could ask my wife to pass out this uh, handout. Um, it's a kind of, uh, how might we think about topics in terms of marketness? And let's see if I run off without my own copy. Here it is. Here it is. Um, so in terms of marketness, uh, you may recall in my Musical Meeting in Beethoven book, I talked about the minor mode as the tragic marked dimension whereas the major mode is unmarked. And it is the unmarked dimension in which we find comic buffa, pastoral, heroic, haunt, religioso, all these other fields of meaning, if you will. Um, these 
unmarked major mode realms must be further marked <laughs> by other forms of features in order to take on their characteristic place in the, if you will, semantic field comprising these larger modes. Now, marked oppositions among textures are based upon corresponding styles. I would consider the galant to be unmarked. Danuta Mirka says the galant is not a topic, but I think it can be used topically. <laughs> if you start as a fugue and all of a sudden have an imported galant passage, then the galant, even though it is the unmarked center of the classical style, is being used topically. Um, so other textures, such as the chordal hymn-like texture or polyphonic imitative texture, are thus marked against the backdrop of unmarked um, galant style. So if you turn the page, uh, I put in a tiny little box at the top, Wendy Allenbrook's metrical spectrum. And I think there are ways that we can go further there as well. Uh, one might talk about marked meters, and within those meters, you could have marked grooves. The saraban, for example, is a groove. And here, Peter, I think of your own uh, notion of the flexibility of tempo, and which was also mentioned in Juan's uh, paper. Um, that second beat, uh, how that is handled, what degree of stress, what degree of length, uh, can vary, of course, from um, tradition or town to town even. We all know the story, of course, of the mazurka in that context where one claimed that Chopin was playing it actually in 4-4, four, four, counted four beats, but he was always hearing it in three with an extremely lengthy agogic on the second beat. Um, the bourre with its quarter note upbeat. The gavotte has a particular groove. It's not tum, 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 da, da, tum, tum, tum. You could mistake that as being a downbeat. It's yum, bum, so it has a particular kind of groove that will play with the evenness of pulse. Then we have marked tempos. This is the way that we distinguish three different topics in 6-8. Fast, gig, moderate, pastoral, and slow, as it turns out, it was faster in the Baroque. But by Mozart's time, the Siciliano is being used for the high style high tragic, as in the slow movement of the A major piano concerto. So forth. Um, then we can look at unmarked meters. The common time, why did it get the name common time? If it weren't an evidence of its being unmarked, it doesn't always have to be a dance, same with three, four. And when these are not being used as specific topics, they can be filled with variable content. And then finally, we have even unmarked topics. The contradance, I think, is a good example of an unmarked kind of topic. Um, it can be used quite transparently, as it were. We don't typically, ah, a contradance. <laughs> we may notice it, as Juan pointed out in the Opus 2 number 1, as already being a kind of a background accompaniment. But I must say, I had never thought of that. So this was a revelation for me. Finally, we have marked what I call tropes affecting stylistic registers. So you could have a 4-4 four, four march that's in a buffa or comic mode, and that was represented earlier with the um, 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 in your paper uh, when you uh, talked about and we only understood it as march later, right? That wasn't your paper, no. Who was the one who talked about that example? I can't remember. Peter, was that yours? Okay, I'm forgetting. Anyway, and then finally, certain pairings can suggest a high and low opposition. Now, Alan Brooke calls it um, ecclesiastical versus gallant. I just prefer the more generic high versus low style. Um, and for example, the Landler, a low style versus the Minuet, a higher style, becomes a premise, in fact, for K332. So that it starts with Landler, moves to Minuet, and when you get the closing theme, yum, bum, bum. He's combining both Minuet and Landler. So it has a kind of a, a narrative um, projection. It's the productivity of the trope, if you will. So there are some of the ways in which we can continue to develop topic theory in ways that do not um, pin us down in a very strict uh, taxonomy.
So thank you. Thank you. And all this ultimately derives from those 30 pages uh, yes. in <laughs> Leonard Ratner's classic music. So um, it's really a remarkable achievement. Now, uh, I think we have some, uh, some time for uh, further discussion. And uh, if you agree, we could perhaps open the discussion to our public. Uh, so uh, would anyone have questions, comments? Our technical advisors is either to go uh, uh, to the front and speak in front of the mic, or to trans uh, to uh, say it to the uh, colleagues at the panel, and they to refuse yes. the question. Or I can just bring a microphone. Yeah. Can that work? Mm -hmm. uh, are there questions? Yeah, the gentleman there. Yeah, I can come here. I think it's easier, okay. if you don't mind. Sure. Go ahead and just have a seat where I was sitting. Uh, or, or have the mic. Sorry, just hold the mic here. Hello. Hi. So I really agree with your discussion earlier on um, the differences between Monel's approach and Mirka's approach to topics. Uh, I've had the same thoughts myself. But to go even a step further, uh, taking into account someone like Julia Kristeva, who says that, well, a text is essentially a pastiche of other texts. So why then do we make a distinction between a full text being rather a genre and not a topic, and topics only defined as parts of texts? texts? when we can say that even being a part of a genre is, in fact, a sort of dialogue with other texts, a quotation of other composers' works. Yes, thank you very much for a very interesting question. Uh, Robert, you don't have to um, stay yeah. there. You can okay. <laughs> remain seated. Go ahead. Uh, um, very interesting question, and in fact, I agree with you, um, because in many, well, I myself, as it happens, very interested in uh, intertextuality as a subject. So, uh, of course, I know that that passage by Kristeva very well. She actually says um, every text is made of mm, is um, something like a collage, something like a mosaic, a mosaic of, of quotations, exactly. Um, I think that, in a sense, uh, topic theory is part of intertextuality. There is no other way to, to put it. I don't know if you agree with that, but uh, intertextuality is a wider concept. Um, and uh, of course, there are several layers of uh, intertextuality, um, including um, traditions, rhetorical traditions, quotations, um, genres, all, all those things are part of, uh, of intertextuality. Or as I prefer to say, actually, um, I, um, I find uh, Gérard Genet's uh, terminology more interesting, more um, nuanced in certain respects. And um, uh, Genet, for instance, would um, probably, if he had ever had any, any, any knowledge about topic theory as we understand it, uh, would probably place, place it somewhere within his own subcategory of architextuality or something like that. So, um, yes, uh, I think we are really um, very much within the same same universe. Uh, texts are not um, isolated um, things. Um, they are always... Um, I, I like the, the etymology of the word text because text, as you know, comes from in Latin, uh, the verb texeo or texere, which means to uh, weave. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I like this metaphor of the text as a textile. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are lots of threads within that, uh, that idea of, of the text. So yes. Clive, I think you wanted to say something? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a little complex just because uh, if we take the basic definition of, of a topic as taking music from one place and using it in another, um, what that doesn't take into account is the scale of the reference. So it might be 
a fanfare. It could be as much as a, a little motif, a little triadic outline or something, and, and, and that's a topical reference. Uh, or it might be uh, a genre. It might be the, uh, some of the dance types that Robert has just been talking about, for instance, that, that are obviously on a on a much larger scale context. Uh, yeah, in, in terms of their context. So uh, uh, I would say topics, therefore, uh, a little complicated because, simply because of matters of scale. Yes, thanks. Robert, want to add something? Yes, I would just simply say that this is coming on still. There or not. That there is still some integrity to the notion of a work. It's not simply the node of all these crisscrossing um, references and so forth. There is something that a composer is creating that is sui generis for that work. And that the use of topics, just like the use of commonplaces in um, the Iliad or whatever, you know, we'll, we'll have a banquet scene. Yes, we know what that is. But there's obviously something original that's being added to that, right? So uh, it's, you cannot completely define a text with all of the other intertext surrounding it, in my opinion. Juan. Well, I would like to say a word to the uh, apparent paradox of uh, these little 30 pages and its big, their big impact. Uh, if you take, of course, the, the wider focus uh, and take um, other publications by Ratner, there's, there's another book and there's uh, all these rich articles as well. And um, if you take into, into consideration the uh, German um, antique roots of his theory that he never fully formulated, arguably, but that was continued then by all, all his children and grandchildren, uh, then the whole thing becomes much bigger than 30 pages. Then it really becomes a big uh, cultural uh, trope, if you want. And, uh, and I, th I think uh, this is the way, and it's a, a productive way to look at, at those 30 pages. That's what ma makes them big, probably. These, these roots and, and the, the fruits that they bear. And uh, I would uh, like also to reply to the um, unmarked contradance, <laughs> of course, because um, it would be uh, unmarked only if you don't look at it structurally. But it is usually placed in a way, at least in my analyses, where there is a structural opposition with, in this case, in the, in the, pop, 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 the, the sonata, um, with the um, martial call of words. Um, with which it, it collides and uh, uh, it complement it complement each other. The both uh, both uh, tall boy, don't they? Yes, and that's the further markedness, the further markedness that defines the originally unmarked within the context of other dances. Is all I mean. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. Thanks for a great uh, great. Uh, very rich talk. I wanted to ask about the, so we talked a lot about the uh, changing state of the research. I wonder if you could talk about the changing state of topics in your own teaching over the past 42 years. How, how has it shifted? How did it start in your teaching? How did it, how did it change? Did it change at all? Well, as I mentioned, I, I grabbed Alan Brooks' book off the shelf of Borders Bookstore in 1983, and that year I was teaching Don Giovanni. So, uh, I just found it so relevant. We sat there with a full score and played and, you know, sang and just went through it. <laughs> and I, it was a revelation in many ways because hers was the first full-fledged working out for two operas um, and the, the pastoral in Marriage of Figaro, for example. And all the subtleties of interpretation. So for me, topic theory became a key towards closer interpretation, nuancing of the topics. Um, yes, I also discovered Alan Brooks' uh, book uh, when I was a student, and I, I have to say I was fascinated, more than fascinated. It is really one of the books that changed my life as a musicologist because I started listening differently, and I think this is the most important thing a, a teacher or a scholar can 
offer to a, to a student is a, a, a different way to, uh, to listen to music. Um, not necessarily the right way, but uh, another way to, 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 to actually hear things that are there, but that you never heard before. And I think this is really a great merit of the book. It's very well written, it's very compelling, it's, it's one of the greatest books in the history of musicology, in my opinion. Uh, so for me, yes, it was a, a absolutely a fascinating experience. As far as my, my job as a teacher and as a musicologist, um, uh, these days uh, I'm, I'm actually more interested in intertextuality as a subject, uh, but as I said before, uh, in answer to our colleague, um, it's it's not a different subject. It is uh, very much related, interrelated, and uh, you can think of topics as part of intertextuality. And um, students actually enjoy uh, topic theory <laughs> in general, uh, I think. And uh, I've had a recent experience this year with doctoral doctoral students in. Uh, Lisbon, where I work and, and live, um, these students, doctoral students, had never heard uh, about, uh, well, they had heard a bit about topic theory, but not much else uh, in terms of intertextuality. And uh, they loved it. They loved it. And um, I think they may be a very, very happy, very happy teacher because. Uh, you know, you feel when when your students like what you want to teach, and uh, when you, they don't like, it's it's pretty obvious. <laughs> so it's not just a matter of liking and not liking, but you you understand what I mean. Uh, people need these these ideas, uh, and uh, and they can be very very fruitful, very illuminating for uh, for every student of music. I think. Clive, you want to add to that? Uh, just to say that, that as somebody who regards himself primarily as a teacher above all, all other things, that, that uh, I like teaching about topic theory for, for exactly the same reasons, that, that students can relate to it. And it's nice to see that revelatory moment when the penny drops and they, they find a different way of listening to the music. And, and I think it particularly appeals to uh, those students who, who are performers, uh, because I think it gets them thinking about, uh, you know, about that, how that might in, uh, affect their own interpretations of the music. So again, this you know, this comes back to something that uh, Joanne was talking about in, in his, uh, his talk this morning. Thanks. We have time for one more question. It's either that or the cakes. <laughs> now I'm going to be hated as the one who oh, uh, yeah. keeps you from the cakes. I'm sorry about that. Um, my question was, what does constitute a musical topic or how hard is it to establish one in the context of perhaps 20th century music? Because we mostly talk about topic theory in the context of 18th century music where you have a rich tradition of, um, of musical repertoire. And I'm thinking of uh, a case of a composer who might be consistently invoking a pattern which might become a topic if other people take it on or is it a topic already if just one person does it consistently uh, over 20 years in his music? So that's my question, I guess. You have just introduced the notion of the self-topic, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. I, I, on that? A, a Beethoven-style topic, for example. Um, doubling. Beethoven figured out a way to create a Picardy third effect in the major key by doubling or tripling the roots and thirds and leaving out the fifth. I found it in several cases. I found the most wonderful case at the end of the slow movement of Opus 135, where in D flat major, finally the last F in the high first violin, uh, three D flats, three Fs. Couldn't be a sweeter sound. And of course, the marked opposition to that would be the open fifth, which sounds very stark and tragic. Um, for Schubert, you wouldn't necessarily call this a topic, but a style type. Uh, the distinction between decrescendo and diminuendo. It's very consistent in Schubert. Decrescendo means just get softer. Diminuendo, softer, and slowing. You may not know that, but um, Wahlberger Litschauer and the uh, notes to the complete edition also confirms what I discovered just distributionally, if you will, 
when I uh, perform Wind Horizon. You know, some of the endings are decrescendo, some are diminuendo, and it makes a difference. So these, they're not consistent for other composers, although there are times when I'd like to think it was applicable to Chopin, when he has a, a wedge and then a diminuendo at a certain point, but it's not always consistent. It is in Schubert. So these are um, peculiar or particular style types that can begin to um, suggest it to others. Thanks. Clive, any thoughts on that? Just that, uh, yet again, it, it's, um, it's the nebulousness of topic theory. We're, we're not going to be able to uh, set strict boundaries with these things. There's, there are always going to be areas of, of overlap and scale. Uh, and, and what works as a topical reference for one composer might not necessarily for another. Uh, and one of the things that, that certainly has come out of my teaching is that certainly students don't necessarily hear topics in the same way. So to some extent, it's in the ear of the beholder. Uh, uh, and actually, I think, you know, that, that, that's a good thing. I don't think we necessarily need to be able to define these things in a, in, in a concrete way. We, as listeners, react differently. Some of these things are, are very obvious and, and, and others are I'll less so, but that's fine. We're dealing with art here, not science. <laughs> Thanks. Um, just a very brief uh, comment on, on, on the question of um, topics in uh, non-18th century repertoire, uh, which I think is a very interesting point. Um, this is another paradox of topic theory, I think. Uh, of course, Leonard Ratner introduced the, the, the term within a book called Classic Music, which is basically about the 18th century repertoire. And this prompts somehow the idea that uh, topics are a thing of the 18th century. And for a long time, people tended to think that it was so. Personally, I am I'm convinced that um, we have we have topics everywhere. I would dare say, uh, certainly in the 19th and the 20th and the 21st centuries. And uh, there is some work done on the 19th century, not yet so much compared to the 18th, but there is very little on the 20th and the 21st century, with some exceptions, but uh, it's still a very wide field uh, that needs to be addressed, I think. Uh, we do have topics in 20th and 21st century music. How could we not? <laughs> uh, that's Well, that's my view. But, uh, <laughs> Absolutely, and James, you might want to mention a few names here. Of Joanna Freimauer, for example, and others. Scott Schumann. Scott Schumann. Yes, uh, um, and the woman who did other topics in Schoenberg and so forth. Well, tomorrow I'm giving a paper on a 20th century topic, so if you are interested, and, you can always... And I will argue <laughs> on, su on Sunday uh, the topical use of the Italianate aria in an Allemande of Bach. So clearly Bach was intertextual in his <laughs> blending of different styles, and, and, and we could say topics as well. So, right. Good. So I think uh, it's about time to uh, stop. <laughs> Thank you very much, Clive. Thank you. And you. Robert. Well done. <laughs> that was a beautiful introduction. Oh. I would say I would say nice to see you, Robert, but I can't see him. <laughs> I'm over here. <laughs> uh, welcome. It was such a joy to hear you and see you as well. Hi, Robert. <laughs>